السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر ایٹین آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی کمپوننٹ آف لرننگ از دا میسجنگ پلیٹ فارم اینڈ اٹ از کمنگ ٹو بی کنٹینیویشن آف دا پریویس ون بیکاز دیر آر اسٹل فور مور ایلیمنٹس ان ریلیشن ٹو دا میسجنگ پلیٹ فارم دیر آئی نیڈ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ دا ون از دا بوائلر پلیٹ دی ادر ون از دا ایلیویٹر پچ دی تھرڈ ون از دا لیکسیکون آف ٹرمینالوجی اینڈ دا فورتھ ون از دا اسٹائل گائڈ لیٹ اے اسٹارٹ ویتھ دا بوائلر پلیٹ ویل ساؤنڈس کین اے فنی بیکاز دا بوائلر پلیٹ آئی شوڈ ناٹ ریئلی ہیو اینی تھنگ ٹو ڈو ویتھ دا پرنسپلس آف مارکیٹنگ مینجمنٹ بٹ دا فیکٹ از دیٹ دس ٹرمینالوجی از یوز ان سو مینی ادر ڈسپلنس مور سو این لا بینکنگ insurance, and uh, property dealing, uh, just to name a few. You might have noticed um, a collection of a lot of paragraphs in very small font as terms and conditions on the backside of a contract. Because whenever you sign some contract with a bank or insurance company or even with um, an internet provider, there is a whole lot of uh, terms and conditions, so the printing on the backside, which none of us cares to read, by the way. But the fact is that uh, it is those terms and conditions that um, basically provide a sound platform for the contract to work. And uh, the functionality of the whole contract is contingent upon those terms and conditions. So the term boilerplate is borrowed from those disciplines and uh, it is applied into the area of management and the marketing management. But of course, here we are not concerned about the legalities. We are basically concerned about those things which are used as standards. Taking a look at those uh, the terms and conditions, um, you know, as, as, as an image, I'm not saying, you know, line by line, you read everything that's given there. But if you take, you see, an image um, in your mind of those terms and conditions, they look standardized. They look kind of a format which cannot be changed. And they look like something you know, which appear over and over again whenever a contract is signed or whenever a communication is directed toward anyone. So the essence that uh, I'm going to talk about here is that of uh, the repetition of certain uh, messages or certain uh, copy uh, of uh, communication that is going to be uh, used over and over again. It is a format uh, which uh, should not be changed. Now, this is not to say that this is a legal uh, document and therefore no change can be brought about. Uh, the fact is okay, that whenever need be, okay, we can bring about a change. Okay, but then again, the essence of uh, the good communications or rather consistent communications okay, which have been derived out of a strategic process um, is that, uh, okay, that we do not uh, okay, do tampering with uh, the essence of for those communications uh, time and again. Uh, there has to be a sanity to the communication process and to the positioning and, and the personality with which basically we are trying to portray through our communications uh, remain consistent. Um, th those should not be left to the whims and fancies of people working for the organization or those people at various levels of uh, stakeholders who may have a tendency to say, well, I don't like the logo or I don't like the name. Uh, not giving any cogent reason because why they say so, because why they make those statements. So therefore, a boilerplate is something which wraps up the different key messages into a whole which provides an overall broad picture of the organization, the meaning what the organization is all about. Now, what is it that really can go into the boilerplate copy? Well, You already have learned that, and that is the key messages. If you put together all the key messages into different paragraphs, you get the boilerplate copy. Um, it all depends on your the marketing savvy and uh, the management insight as to uh, what are the points that are to be highlighted and what are the ones that uh, should be um, overlooked um, in case of uh, preparing a good, effective uh, boilerplate copy. It is an expansion of uh, the mission statement and also of the positioning statement because uh, we like to say so many things as part of the mission, uh, but we are constrained because uh, we have to keep our mission statement rather precise and concise. By the same token, uh, we talk about uh, the positioning statement, uh, which of course is very internal 
in the butt. Could we talk about positioning in just about a couple of lines? Like uh, experts say, if we cannot really talk about positioning in just about a couple of lines, we're not clear about the position. And uh, therefore, uh, the positioning statement generally is like in the one, one and a half lines, uh, two lines, like that. And it doesn't mean that uh, we keep our communications as precise or as concise as our mission statement or the positioning statement. There's a lot more that we wish to talk, and that is something that we talk in support of the mission or in support of the positioning. And that is why we talk about all those factors which we think our audiences should know. Uh, we are trying to reach our audiences because we want to convince them that they should take a certain action which is good for the society, which, is, uh, uh, which, which gives them certain benefits before uh, it uh, does something good to the society overall. And therefore, uh, we have to talk about uh, all those factors that are of interest to different audiences as part of the boilerplate copy. From boilerplate, we now get on to the elevator pitch. Well, this is something which is exactly opposite of the boilerplate copy, because this is something, again, precise and concise. But this is not as precise as the mission or as precise as the positioning statement. Yet, it is something which explains the positioning and the personality of the organization in light of the organizational level of brand raising when we are talking with somebody. As the terminology may suggest, we call it elevator pitch because if we happen to be in an elevator and somebody asks us, what do you do? And what does your organization do? We have to explain all that before we get off to the right floor. And therefore, we have just a few moments within which we have to explain who we are and what we do. And we have to be very effective in terms of explaining what the organization is all about. What is its positioning and what is its personality? I think it's quite a daunting task and a challenge. Uh, the fact of the matter is that many man managers are at a loss to explain the elevator pitch. Well, nobody asks them, what is your elevator pitch? Well, somebody asks you a plain question as a layman uh, or as a layperson, uh, what is your organization all about? And you give this elevator pitch. Elevator pitch is a condensation of the mission statement, the positioning statement, and the overall personality of the organization. So when you condense all these things into something which has to be explained, in just about a few moments, as many moments as they may take you to be in the elevator, it becomes quite challenging. So what do you do? In order to meet this particular challenge, the organization's right elevator pitch. So this also becomes kind of a statement which has to be expressed as part of your communications. And uh, the being a very uh, challenging and difficult task, this pitch is uh, prepared and then expressed in very succinct words because you do not really want to be embarrassed when somebody asks you the question which I was talking about. Uh, because if you're not prepared, you might think to yourself, what is it that I should be talking about and what is it that I should not be talking about? There is so much the organization does. How do I respond to this question? Um, this is a strange kind of a question. Well, the answer lies in keeping the answer ready. And it is kind of a ready-made thing, a ready-made format which you have to explain to the one who asks you this question. And experts say that this statement has to be communicated verbally, verbatim, meaning the way, word by word, it is written, you have to say that. By not giving the impression that you're reading out something, you know, it has to be a part of uh, your uh, natural uh, communication style that uh, you insert this statement as part of the two-way communication uh, when you are uh, having a physical encounter uh, with somebody who's interested in knowing uh, what is your organization and what does it do. And therefore, uh, we've got to be uh, very specific about preparing this statement which is an important part of um, the communications that we need to put in place in order to reflect the positioning as well as the personality of the organization. So this, in other words, 
expresses these two uh, traits of the organization, positioning and personality, in connection with the organizational level of the brand raising process. And which you will very conveniently recall is all about your vision, uh, the mission, the values, uh, the key messages, and so on and so forth. Everything wrapped into one succinct statement which you have to remember and say it verbatim. That's it. The next element is the lexicon of terminology. A very, very important uh, instrument and an element of uh, the communications uh, of the organization and for the organization because uh, we uh, need to have uh, this uh, document in order to be very consistent in terms of our communications. And consistency here refers to the jargons that uh, we tend to use as uh, professionals. We are not supposed to be talking about all those jargons uh, which uh, lay people do not understand and follow. Uh, we have to take those out in order to keep our messages uh, very clear. Um, no vagueness and no ambiguity, complete um, clarity. That is the objective of our communications and therefore uh, we have to have uh, those jargons out of them. How do we do that? Well, we prepare an internal document which explains all the terminologies that we think are very professional and um, belong to the area um, of our expertise. And uh, it's not something which is within um, easy comprehension of uh, the audiences that we're trying to reach. So you make a list of all those jargons and then use alternative the words for them. And you also got to write them against those jargons and those become your standards. For example, you may not like to use the word handicapped. If you happen to be working for a nonprofit that is operating in the area of prosthetics, I think uh, I did talk about this particular example. You may not refer to your audiences, rather your clients as uh, the people who are handicapped or disabled you may call them disadvantaged because here you are trying to um, help them um, have a positive uh, side of their self-image. If you uh, talk about those terms which are uh, either not understandable or are understandable but have negative connotations and give the uh, negative image of somebody's self, you should avoid those. I would like to take you back to one more example of drug addicts that I referred to in, in one of the components. Let's not call them uh, addicts. We have to use some other word which sounds uh, a little decent than uh, calling them addicts. You will recall that the influencers uh, over those addicts uh, could be the family members because basically it is because of the troubled family life that they have taken refuge into um, drug taking. And therefore, we have to go talk with the family members in order to bring about a change in their behavior by first bringing about a change in their own behavior so that these people who cannot withstand the rigors of a troubled family life can bring them back to the fold of normal family life. And therefore, we've got to use words which are rather decent. We may call these addicts deviants because they are the ones who are deviating from a normal course of life and therefore calling them deviants may not hurt those family members with whom we are communicating. They are an important audience that we need to reach. So these are the sensitivities which we have to take into consideration in addition to the technical jargons that are not understandable um, in the context of our uh, the communications. We have to make communications very simple, understandable. And uh, that is the essence of uh, the entirety of communications. Whether we talk in relation to the mission or um, with our values, with our positioning, anything that we talk about has got to be uh, simple and understandable because that is the power uh, to engage people. The people associate themselves with things which are rather easy and not difficult. Do not give them the impression that you're trying to impress them. 
With this, uh, we now get on to the last element of the identity level, and this is known as the style guide. And I think the terminology is self-explanatory because it tells us it is a collection of different documents reflecting all the elements that I have talked so far. The meaning all the elements that belong to the organizational level and all the elements that belong to the identity level. Although the style guide itself also a part of the identity level, but this is something which takes into its fold all that we have learned so far. And all that has to go into the style guide has to go in a very professional, standardized manner. Because we don't really want to deviate from a standardized communication uh, process which has to be consistent over and over again. Uh, I will just give you one example from the uh, last element, which is the lexicon. Um, if we talk about uh, disadvantaged people as uh, disabled people or um, handicapped people and keep uh, interchanging the terminology uh, instead of keeping it standardized as uh, the disadvantaged, I think we're making a huge mistake. We're not really consistent in terms of our communications. And that is the essence of the style guide, Kithi, because everybody has to draw on this particular guide Kithi, when different communications are put together. It is not just to see big communication campaigns in terms of our advertising or Kithi, all printed material in terms of articles or annual reports or uh, any kind of professional uh, materials, rather promotional materials like uh, brochures and flyers. It could be daily communications in the form of letterheads. Kithi, we have to uh, talk the same language because we cannot deviate from the standards and standards are contained in the style guide um, document by document and um, there is no uh, exception uh, to the rule that uh, nothing can be changed unless the people responsible for changing the style guide are approached. Now the question is, who are the people who uh, put the whole guide together? Well, it is the same people who helped us develop the visual identity of the organization and also um, helped us with the identity level. And the fact remains that uh, we also get uh, outside help of consultants when it comes to putting together our uh, the different statements as part of the organizational level. We may need the help from consultants in terms of preparing our mission statement, putting together you know, the values statement, and also the, uh, the boilerplate copy. It has to be very professional and people who are uh, um, uh, specialized in this particular task should, should be the ones to uh, approach. Uh, because uh, they will tell us you know, what is verbose and what is to the point, what is succinct. And therefore, all those people have to be a collection of kind of a committee uh, that looks after this uh, sacred style guide. Because nobody should have uh, the authority to just change things because they like things in a certain way or they don't like certain things without any cogent reasons. Any change that has to be brought about in the style guide has to be brought about by that committee. And that committee, again, has to go back to members of management and the board of directors and all those people who have been the part of the whole strategic process. And if you take an incisive look into the whole phenomenon, you will realize how many people will have to be contacted because it is a question of, again, ensuring that things remain consistent that things uh, reflect in a consistent way the positioning and personality of the organization with no distortions uh, in the message. So this is uh, about uh, the importance of the style guide. Now, the next uh, question is, what is it that really goes into the style guide? I have uh, informally talked about uh, so many different elements of the two levels that we have learned so far. Um, going into the style guide, but let me enumerate those one by one. It starts with uh, the, the vision statement and uh, the mission statement and the values statement. Okay, all these statements could have to be uh, the part of the style guide. And as a matter of fact, the guide should start you know, with these statements. Um, and um, then so we get on to things like positioning statement and the personality statement. 
Uh, we also uh, have as uh, the part of the uh, guide uh, the complete uh, the boilerplate copy and uh, elevator pitch and of course the lexicon. And then we have another uh, visual thing uh, which is uh, a very significant uh, the part of the identity level meaning the name of the organization, the logo, the colors along with the palettes, the primary palette, the secondary palette and then you see uh, with instructions as to uh, how those uh, the logos are going to be or not going to be uh, used uh, by anyone uh, within the organization in so many different contexts. Uh, for example, when we are putting together a campaign, this is how we go about it. And if we are uh, writing a daily communication, this is uh, how uh, we follow the guidelines. And by the same token, uh, when we are updating the content uh, of, of the website, uh, we again have to be consistent, um, notwithstanding uh, the difficulties and challenges that um, that the medium uh, offers, uh, for example, the uh, difficulty involved in maintaining the consistency of the font and size uh, when it comes to downloading different uh, communications uh, at different computers, uh, meaning different users uh, will have uh, different fonts, uh, whichever uh, font is the default of that particular computer, there uh, we are kind of constrained to maintain that consistency. But you will recall that uh, we have to be as close to uh, the generic kind of uh, the fonts and sizes uh, which are used uh, universally. And uh, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, the guide uh, must tell us uh, where a change is to be brought about. And before you know, we talk about the change, let us stick ourselves to the consistency side of communications. The guide tells us in absolute uh, black and white uh, what is to be used and what is not to be used. And how something is to be used and how something is not to be used. And uh, then uh, we have things like uh, the photographs and images and other graphics, you know, that uh, we learned as uh, the part of the mood boards. We may also have uh, the final uh, the mood board as uh, the part of the um, style guide, you know, maybe the last document, uh, which uh, is the basis of uh, the identity. Although uh, we talked about mood board uh, after developing and understanding of uh, the important elements of uh, visuals. Uh, but uh, the fact is uh, the, all the um, elements of the visual identity the are put together on the basis of uh, a certain style and theme. And, the th and, 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 and that style and theme are dependent on the mood board. So um, a mood board could also be the part of uh, this style guide. And uh, whenever we think uh, external, environment that has brought about a change and is going to have bearing on whatever we do internally. Uh, we have to sit together, uh, the put our heads down and talk about the corresponding change it may have on our style, uh, on the tone of the message, uh, meaning uh, any change that we think uh, is going to be caused to the personality of the organization. And then could we bring about changes in the same manner I talked earlier, meaning a, in a formal, structured, organized manner, not leaving anything to the whims and fancies or to the authority and power of those you know, who are sitting um, upstairs in the organization. I'll be bold enough to say uh, that the marketing people should safeguard uh, that this uh, that the particular um, treasure um, uh, very uh, secretly and uh, they should guard it very jealously because uh, this is something which is going to give us consistency all over our communication campaigns. Our professional effort does not uh, stop at the development of the style guide. That is the one big step that we have attained with the help of the organizational level and the identity level, uh, but the fact is uh, if we are out to institutionalize a very standardized kind of a system, then we've got to be able to follow that. And uh, we've got to follow that in letter and spirit uh, by not allowing uh, any um, lateral kind of moves. And uh, we ensure that uh, by training people, uh, we train people at different levels of the organization. The fact is that uh, we train uh, the people from the middle management, from the low management, and we also go upwards to uh, the people from top management, so much so that uh, members of the board should also be drawn into the process of uh, 
orientating them, let's not call training them, orientating them about uh, what the style guide is all about and how we have uh, made a very uh, professional, uh, hard effort to put the style and tone um, to express the positioning and the personality of the organization together and uh, what are the uh, parameters within which we are supposed to be uh, operating while we put together our communications. It is not um, a, a very difficult exercise. It only takes um, the effort to organize it. And uh, the people who are part of the front office or the people who are present at the point of entry, the meaning receptionists and so on and so forth, should also be trained in terms of uh, what the mission of the organization is and what are the values and uh, the, boil not the boilerplate, but rather uh, the elevator pitch um, of the organization. Because uh, when they come into interaction with uh, the different audiences, they've got to be able to express themselves in terms of uh, the mission of the company and the elevator pitch. These two statements are the ones which have to be remembered by all those who have uh, the chance of uh, coming into contact with our audiences. And uh, there is no exception uh, to it. Anyone um, who is going to communicate uh, must remember you know, all these things. Uh, he or she you know, must know our you know, the values, our uh, sets of beliefs, you know, because they get translated into the way that we work. And uh, the way we work has got to be expressed in a consistent manner, word by word, in the same language as it is expressed as part of the style guide. Here again, I would say that uh, the people who conduct training, again, are the ones you know, who develop the style guide. They are the ones you know, who, in the first place, uh, help the organization come up with uh, the two levels of uh, the brand raising. And therefore, they should be the people to impart training uh, to um, workers and managers uh, within the organization in order for everybody to be on the same page and on the same line. So much for the identity, the level of the brand raising. And uh, the next level uh, which I indicated to you is the experiential level. But let me make it uh, very clear right here that I'm not going to talk about this level right away uh, because uh, we need to develop uh, some uh, level of basic understanding of a few other factors uh, that are important uh, to appreciate uh, before we get on to the experiential level. So wait until that time that we have completed uh, our understanding of those things. This component is impediments to effective messaging. So it automatically conveys that uh, there are uh, the certain difficulties that organizations face uh, while they try to put together communications. Although the process of brand raising is just about the, the most ideal the way of for developing the brand and uh, then uh, coming up with uh, the appropriate communications to support the brand, uh, but uh, it does not really happen that way all the time. Uh, there are uh, non-profit organizations that uh, do not really follow that particular route and uh, they are operate rather on ad hoc basis. Why do they do so? Well, the answer lies in um, kicking off a program and getting so much involved and absorbed into the mechanics of uh, program execution that uh, they tend to forget uh, in the first place that uh, they have to uh, put communications before they have uh, gotten onto the program. And the second reason could be that uh, they are uh, somewhere along the line constrained to come up with the kind of communications or to come up with the kind of strategic process that I just talked about. Because it obviously takes a lot of human resource and a certain level of expertise to come up with uh, all those uh, logical conclusions by linking different elements of the whole process together in a strategic manner. And therefore, uh, the organizations tend to uh, skip uh, this particular process of communication which is uh, arrived at the uh, level of positioning and personality um, after following the whole thing that I just said. And they skip this particular factor or step and get on to program execution, kind of fundraising and advocacy for their cause. 
you know, because they think these are more important uh, jobs at hand and uh, the communication for the time being can take the back seat. The fact of the matter is that communication should take the front seat or the driver's seat because uh, the communication is the one which helps uh, these uh, the three areas of nonprofits. Uh, we know very well that these are the three major areas for which any nonprofit organization exists. And those are fundraising. We have to approach uh, the individuals, corporations, the foundations, the different agencies, meaning governmental, the international, and so on and so forth. We have to execute programs by engaging with different audiences. And these are the audiences that lend us support in terms of program execution. And then we need to have an opportunity whereby we can advocate the cause in a manner that those who are engaged get more and more motivated and involved into the program. These areas are to be supported with the communication and unless they are supported by communication they cannot be as effective as any nonprofit would like to see them and therefore uh, here you know there's a contradiction with the organizations could mostly get the putting these factors before the communication process well this is what you call a short term viewpoint now the question again here is could, why is it that the follow this particular route knowing that uh, communication process is significant to the organization. They may also have, or rather in most of the cases, they do have an understanding of the strategic process, but then they shy away from the details and the sophistication involved at so many different levels because, like I said, they want to get down to the execution all of a sudden, which is not the right approach. Let me say here. The factors which cause this kind of a behavior the meaning being ad hoc, you know, jumping from situation to situation, responding to different stimuli that uh, come up uh, in relation to these three areas that I talked about, uh, the fundraising, uh, program execution, and um, advocacy, they do all that because they have to face challenges which are much harder than the ones people face on the commercial side. So this is a fact of life that uh, the marketing people with the working for nonprofits that they have to the work in an environment and atmosphere that are much more harder and challenging. But what makes the whole thing that challenging and that much harder? Well, they have to deal with um, so many different levels of leadership you know, they have to deal with their the top management, they have, have to convince um, the board of directors, they have to the talk with um, the different uh, important stakeholders who are very important to our existence and our sustenance because they are responsible for so much of advocacy, they are responsible for bringing in activists and volunteers and they are very important links between the organization and funding. Here you see, we're not talking or dealing with a situation in which the revenue stream is a function of selling a product, which is difficult, but not all that difficult as generating funds in a compli complicated way as nonprofits follow. You have to go to audiences and talk with them in certain peculiar manner that I have talked about just over the last you know, couple of lectures and then you succeed in getting certain portions of what you want. Conversely, if you are in a position to do good branding of your product and you can develop a good sales platform, then you develop the revenue stream and you can fully concentrate on communications. But here, conversely, in nonprofits, the case is very different. They have to deal with different levels of leadership, like I said. They have to go through a very complicated way of generating funds, and they have to put together the different programs in connection with so many different and diverse audiences. 
So these are the factors that keep marketing people in nonprofits from following the strategic process, which uh, sounds very logical and which is the one one should follow, but they skip that process and they get on with their daily routines in terms of program execution. And this is something which uh, in the long run is not feasible. Now, this is not to say that a short-term approach is the wrong approach and any organization that follow a short-term approach are bound to fail. It is not that. The many organizations get to start with a very noble vision, but they do not start with a strategic process. They do get down to program execution um, on the very first day. And uh, they make uh, their programs uh, successful. They accomplish their uh, mission, their names, uh, whatever is the background of choosing the name, uh, the meaning, uh, just a simple, plain, straightforward name uh, with no tagline, with the but results and delivery over the past years and experiential cash, so to say, they are successful. So where's the problem? Well, the problem is this thing cannot go on like that forever. They reach a point um, in the life of the organization where they are growing and they're growing fast. And that is the point when they start realizing that whatever has happened so far has been a function of what experts call accidental branding. So accidental branding is the one which accumulates challenges. It is more challenging. It adds to your challenges. So why face unnecessary and undue challenges? That is the thesis of the whole exercise. We should not uh, be getting into situations which are uh, harder. Uh, hard is hard enough. And therefore, we should confine ourselves to something which is more logical and which in essence is strategic. When they realize the stage of uh, the accidental branding, uh, which has been successful, but they have started now realizing the need to go strategic, the questions that flash into their mind are the following. They start talking about things like, well, there seems to be something wrong with the logo because it's not uh, really colorful. We developed this logo with the help of people who were not really very good professionals. So we've got to undertake an effort, you know, which can revise the logo and make it more attractive and make it more expressive of our character and our personality. There is something wrong with the name because the name is not powerful enough. We've got to change the name. And when they start thinking of a change of name, they also start thinking of repositioning, if repositioning is desired. And then the answer lies in you know, following the whole process which they should have uh, undertaken in the very first place. Well, it's never too late. If um, they follow the process uh, in order to convert an accidental brand into a strategic brand, then they must answer these questions and they must ponder over the implications of these questions. You know, they say our message is not really going across because what is wrong with it? Despite the fact that uh, we have been able to generate um, a sizable amount of uh, the funding, but fact, fact also remains that uh, we have not been able to generate as much as uh, we could have. So uh, where have things gone wrong? That's uh, where you've got to rejuvenate uh, your brand and uh, you've got to look into uh, all these things that are required uh, on your part to go strategic. The answers to these questions take uh, the such organizations uh, the into the realm of what you and I can call long-term view and uh, the long-term planning for that matter, because uh, this is where they start realizing the need uh, to have uh, a flowing continuity of all the elements of the organization level as well as the identity level in order to arrive at the right visual identity for the organization. The answer to questions like something wrong with the logo and there is something wrong with the name and so on and so forth could well be addressed uh, once they start taking uh, the long view. The organizations that take uh, a long view are the ones which really 
okay, to follow things like following a well-planned okay, calendar of activities okay, the like you put up together as part of a project management program, um, explaining all the, the marketing activities okay, with expenses, uh, desire to execute those activities, also with responsibilities as to okay, who's going to do what, and also okay, they're talking about the time frames, okay, when different activities are going to be completed, and then also the showing as part of the, the same exercise, um, the variances, so the ones that you have started implementing this particular plan, the variances in terms of what you had, you had planned and um, put together as your objectives and goals and what is it that you have achieved and where the, uh, the variances are. These are the kind of things which uh, organizations that take the long-term view uh, undertake. And when they do all that, they also take care of the fact that their organizational level and identity level are derived out of a continuous process that ensures a very close link between the process and the brand. This is the link which makes or rather which turns the short-term uh, the branding uh, the into a long-term perspective. And uh, when you start taking uh, this kind of a perspective, uh, you also uh, become very choosy about the process of uh, the communications. And the fact is that uh, the good organizations, uh, even if they are uh, very resourceful and uh, have the luxury of getting into uh, the very expensive and um, uh, comprehensive kind of uh, campaigns, uh, shy away uh, from uh, getting into areas uh, where they think uh, they may make a mistake or where they may flounder. Uh, for example, they may not like to uh, get into uh, social networking until the time that they think they have the right kind of uh, the human resource uh, that is going to manage the two-way traffic of um, the blogosphere or uh, for that matter, uh, people uh, who really can uh, be quick at uh, uh, choosing the right network, uh, most appropriate uh, for uh, the, uh, the program of the organization, and also the people uh, who really can uh, detect uh, where the opportunities are and where the threats are, the people who are not only good at uh, traditional marketing, but also are uh, good at uh, extracting the where uh, from the web they can pick and extract the right stories uh, the which uh, they may become the part of uh, key messages in turn um, finding their way into the boilerplate copy given all the, this uh, perspective organizations that are not taking a long view would have got to be able to adopt all those uh, steps or uh, measures which can uh, the transform their uh, the short-term thinking into a long-term one. The, what is that thinking and uh, the, what are those steps and factors? Uh, I'll be talking in um, a different uh, component, uh, but let me give you an overview of uh, those um, steps in continuity of uh, the perspective of those organizations uh, which do take a long-term view. Well, in the first place, the organizations not taking a long-term view, they should be good at uh, taking a very realistic stock of their own resources. The ones they know, the way they really stand in terms of uh, financials and also the human resources and the, what really are their uh, the capabilities, they are in a position to come up with something which can trigger the strategic process. The second thing they have to be very sensitive to is right communication. Right communication is a function of uh, the reachability uh, to the right audience with uh, a message that really connects uh, with uh, the audience. In other words, we've got to use a language and uh, keep it uh, so understandable that uh, our audiences react to that in a positive way, the meaning that they take certain action uh, and, um, and then get um, involved with the cause. Communication has got to be uh, directed toward our audiences so that they start advocating our cause as our 
partners. They become stakeholders. Yet another area in which uh, the organizations the must look into, despite uh, their uh, the shortcomings in terms of uh, the finances, uh, the human resources, uh, the staff members, and uh, the budgeting and so on and so forth, they must develop a certain level of the management expertise which should lay the foundation for good operational planning and budgeting. When you develop the operational plans, you automatically also get into developing systems and procedures. And it is a systematic approach which really means to the stakeholders. And the whole idea here is to convince all those people who matter for the organization in terms of its funding and other supports which you know very well are requisite supports in order for the organization to sustain itself in the first place and then further grow. Once you have convinced the stakeholders that you should be in a position to do a better job in terms of raising funds and uh, executing your programs uh, with uh, a higher level of uh, the resources, uh, not only financial, uh, but also uh, the human resources. Uh, I will be talking about uh, how to uh, leverage the, uh, the human resource uh, while you do not have uh, the human resource uh, of your own in the next component. Uh, but again, the crux of the whole matter is that uh, as part of the nonprofit, uh, you should be good at the generating support in so many different forms from all those audiences that really matter to you. And the audiences that really matter to you in the first place are the donors and funders. And then you see all those people who advocate your cause and support you toward execution of the programs. As long as you are in a position to muster that kind of uh, support that you should be in a position to put together a strategic process um, and uh, then follow it uh, to uh, arrive at um, a strategic positioning and personality for your organization. We're going to more on this in the next component. Thank you very much.